Earlier on in the meeting, somebody prayed out and just said, um, many, many years ago I did surrender. Um, but Lord, I really want to surrender to you again today. And I thought, you know, how relevant that is. Um, we can look back many, many years, some of us, and we can say, yes, that work was done. But you know, it's a little bit like some people would say, I was saved but I am being saved today because we need to be saved today. We've got histories and it's wonderful and that's happened. But that just caught my attention that I surrender all today because tomorrow is another decision, another day, isn't it? And some would say I have been saved, I am being saved and I will be saved. That's the voice of faith speaking. I will surrender, I have surrendered, I will surrender. And the sort of the thing that came to me really was when we read in our New Testaments about those 12 disciples, we read about them, don't we? And we read about those years that they had with the Lord and you know, the, the, the mistakes that were made and the things that were said which they regretted saying and the pure, I'm going to do this. Lord, you can't say that, as Peter once said. Lord, I, you can't say that. And I thought, my goodness, when you then read about what happened to those men, each one of them, they were absolutely and completely kind of transformed, weren't they? Think of the power of the Holy Spirit coming in. And I know um, in that, that sort of that, feat, that, that film that's being done of the life of Christ recently, and it's kind of carrying on. Somebody will tell me what it is. The Chosen, that's right. You know, the, the way that Matthew, um, I haven't seen much of it, but the way that that Matthew, that tax collector, is portrayed as the most awkward, the most timid, the most inadequate. But it's remarkable, isn't it, what happens when the Spirit comes. When a life says, I, I surrender everything, then does it mean that life and everything else becomes simple? Well, we read in our New Testaments that actually things don't become simple. And sometimes there were disciples that had to put each other right. But I believe it was done all in the spirit of God because they had the spirit of God given to them. So how, how does that kind of apply, apply to us today? And I, I just look at it and I think, do you think that you are you know, a strong-willed person or do you think you're a weak-willed person? How do you sort of view yourself? And I was just reading a little snippet the other day of a man who I'm sure, I haven't actually read the biography, but it was President Nixon, it was his fixer, and I think his name was Coulson or something like that, Charles Coulson. And he ended up, he said, you know what, there are two types of people in this world. They're the ones that cry out to Jesus. They have a point in their lives where they cry out to Jesus and then there's the other type. And the other type is, I'm all right, I am self-sufficient, I have all that I need, I don't need any help from anyone else. And that was him for many, many years of his life. He was the fixer. He was the man that would sort the problems out for a president and his administration. And if there was a problem, he would go and sort it out. And he tried to sort out, and it all went wrong for him. And he ended up, by the grace of God, as one of those who cried out to the Lord, despite all his natural abilities, despite everything that he was, the qualities. I mean, the man was obviously 
you know, would go to the nth degree, would lie, cheat, steal, kill. But he got to the point, and I haven't read the biography, I may do one day, but he ended up, didn't he, in prison, was that right? I think he ended up in prison, but do you know, he got to the point where by the grace of God, he cried out and called out to God, and I'm sure he asked for forgiveness, and all those wonderful things happened. So I don't know, you know, we can look at our characters and say, we're this, we're that. But do you know when we surrender all, he uses us. We become instruments in his hand. Do you believe that? It's you and he uses me. And you might think I'm more like Matthew, or you might say I'm more like Peter, or I'm more like Charles Coulson, or I'm miles away from them. I'm, but all have to humble themselves and put out that heart cry and declare again, I'm not looking at my good or my bad track record. Glory to God, he can come in a moment. And the past has gone. The past track record has gone. Yesterday's inappropriate words that you wish you could take back, but you can't. <laughs> That's the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. That's how he works. And he wants you. And he wants me. And he will transform and change. But what needs to happen is there needs to be that humbling and that bowing of the knee that cries out to Jesus. I was thinking of that guy, Charles Coulson. Probably had immense wealth, immense connections, immense this and immense that, but it wasn't good enough for him. Wasn't enough. And it's not good enough for Jesus who says, you know, you don't come to me holding on to things. You don't come to me with all your kind of preconditions. You have to come, as was prayed this morning, on that basis of a complete surrender to Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And praise God, if you've walked for many years, there's still more. Still more to be had. Still more, uh, a further walk to take place. Until, as we sung earlier, our feet are next to that river and we feel the, the lapping water and we're going to be taken home but until that point we're his aren't we and we surrender all to Jesus and look at the transformation that happened when you see a Peter or those ones that were called the, the, the sons of thunder Whatever it was, Simon the Zealot, I think it was, he would have gone out and he would have taken life and he would have had it all his way. But he had to come and bow and surrender and receive of the Spirit of God. And we give thanks that his life is an overcoming life. Hallelujah. Amen. Carry on from some of the things that have been said already. Um, thank you, Paul. Good morning. There's a verse in Romans chapter 8. You don't have to turn to it. I can assure you it's there. Um, it's verse 28. It says, And we know that all good things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. It goes on about being brethren. Yeah. But he was to be the firstborn of many brethren. God wanted and wants sons. 
which follows on from what Yvonne said. It's about first generation people. When in the very beginning, God created Adam, and he thought, well, this is my, my creation. He is, in a sense, my son. I have made him. I've created him out of the earth. But he got it wrong and disobeyed God and followed his wife. He had the opportunity to say, no, we won't do that. Um, but he chose just to eat the fruit and the whole of humanity went wrong. And uh, at various places during... Oh, I seem to have gone very loud. Um, various places during the history and the outwork through the Bible, God intervenes in lives. And he, he creates a... No, he doesn't create. He opens up circumstances of barrenness, where there is barrenness in, in a couple. God will open it up. And he gave Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, a son of promise, and he was called Isaac, um, which means laughter, because Sarah laughed at the impossibility of what God was suggesting, that there would, she and her husband, would bring forth a son. But that was what, what God did. But it was a human son. It was a human, natural interaction between a husband and a wife, and yes, God worked somehow in the inner workings of either the man or the woman, but they created a son that way. And it wasn't a replacement for the son that he had originally created. It was still just a human son. And the same is true if you read in 1 Samuel, where... Um, Hannah, um, I can't remember her husband's name, Elkanah, isn't it? Yeah. Um, she was another barren woman. And she went to the Lord and cried out to him. And um, Eli, the priest at the time, thought she was drunk because she was moving her mouth and not saying anything. But she was crying out in her heart. She wanted a son and a child. And God intervened in their lives. And she, in the end, through normal human activity, brought forth a son. And that was Samuel, who became a great priest and prophet. But it wasn't, still wasn't, what was in God's heart for that special son. You can follow this through even, I mean, there are many other examples. I'm not going to, um, to deal with them all. Um, if you go into the, the New Testament, um, there's one that is relevant, really, is John the Baptist the birth of John the Baptist. His parents had long, long, long wished for a son, but didn't, um, didn't manage it. Um, but when, this is in Luke chapter one, when Zacharias was going about the priestly duties in the temple, um, he went into the, the inner part of the temple. He um, was met by an angel. And an angel came to him, appeared at his side, standing on the right side of the altar in the instance. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. This is a prayer that had gone back years and years and years and years because they were now probably into their 50s, 60s, whatever, and there's been no child. 
So your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will call his name John. And you have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Ah, Holy Spirit. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. So he's more or less saying, really? I can't believe that. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. And behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. Hmm. A bit for ticking off from an angel, angel Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. Amen. So he was then silent, but it came about that indeed Elizabeth conceived and um, they had, um, they eventually had um, John the Baptist and he was um, born to them by the intervention of God again in normal human manner. Barrens was removed, whatever um, biological things needed to happen, that's what God did. But this was a human son child. So, if you go on into this um, chapter, um, yeah. It's in um, chapter, verse, sorry, chapter 1, verse 26. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, same angel, was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. People are shocked when they, they see an angel, I think, and they wonder what it's all about. I think I would be. I've never seen an angel, certainly not the angel Gabriel, not come into my bedroom and said to me anything. So, yeah, I maybe would be a bit disturbed. So she was troubled at this saying, considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favour with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Wow. This is, okay. She was a virgin girl, 18 years old, whatever. And then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I know not a man? She's never been with a man no sexual relationships or anything. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Wow. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be to me, 
according to your word. And the angel departed from her. There is so much in that little passage that is amazingly unique and precious. This virgin girl God had chosen. She had found favour in his sight. And it's important we recognise that she was a virgin. She'd never been with a man. So she was pure and holy in, in the sight of God. And the angel said, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you call his name Jesus. And she says, Well, how can that happen? And the answer the angel gives is, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. God will work by his Spirit to conceive his Son in your womb. And this was sonship that God wanted not some of the other human interventions that he'd made along the way. This was God putting right what had gone wrong back in the Garden of Eden. But he was doing it through a pure virgin by the overshadowing power of his Holy Spirit and his his own being, which he was going to conceive in this young woman. She wasn't married. What would that mean? In those days, if you were an unmarried woman and you got pregnant, you could have been stoned. Fortunately, she was betrothed to a, a man to be married. And God spoke to him and said, don't worry, it's all right. This is a child of God. Nothing else. There's no impurity here, it's from me. Be confident, hear my voice, take her to be your wife. But they, the child was God's child. And I find this, this is, this is where the first generation business comes from. He was the first begotten of many brethren. But you have to be begotten, like Jesus was in this girl's womb. She she faced ignominy, really, and people pointing fingers and saying, well, that's the woman that got pregnant and nobody really knows who the father is. And I mean, she, she was prepared to go through anything came at her, she utterly surrendered herself unto the Lord and said, be it unto me, your handmaid, as you have spoken. Laid down everything, her reputation, future prospects of other marriage or if that marriage didn't work. She didn't know, did she? She was completely, it was all unknown territory because nobody ever before had conceived a baby by the overshadowing power of God himself. I mean, it's amazing. And this young girl says, yes, I'll do it, Lord. There's no surrendering like that other than saying yes to the Lord ourselves. It's... It's just amazing. The Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And he was to be born in this young girl's womb. That was the conception, the birth that came after it. If you go into chapter 2, it talks about the birth. The time came for her to be born, came to pass in those days, blah, 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 blah. And she was in Bethlehem to bring forth the child. 
That was perfectly natural. It was a baby in her womb, and she gave birth, and there he was. But he wasn't an ordinary baby. He was conceived of God, overshadowing power of God had conceived him in her, and then she brought him forth. The first begotten of many brethren. And there is a pattern in that. God's pattern, pattern, sorry, is for all of us. We have to come, a bit like um, was being said earlier on, you have to come to a point, like Pete was saying, where you have to cry out to God and surrender all, everything, utterly, and say, Yes, Lord, I will face whatever comes my way, whether my neighbours don't like me, whether my, I lose my job, whether this, whether that, whether they put me in prison in Charles Coulson's day, case. You have to surrender all. There is a hymn, isn't there? I surrender all. And it's quite easy to sing. I surrender all. But to do what this girl did, was to surrender all that she surrendered at that point was massive. But that's what he asks of us today. Young and old, there'll come a point where he'll draw you and draw you and draw you until you say, well, what about your heart? Are you going to be one of these Christians, Pete was saying, or one of these people who becomes a Christian and gives his life to God, or are you just going to go on your own sweet way, doing your own thing, relying on yourself, and sadly, you end up, you'll go to hell, but he didn't actually say that. But that's the truth of it. We have to surrender and be willing to let go of everything. It's the pattern. And this is what um, well, John in his gospel says. Lost my little note. Pretty thin, these notes. This was all a bit hastily put together. In John, first chapter of John, he says, And the world, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this is where John is coming from, and he repeats it again. Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Amen. So when you turn forward into chapter 3 and Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night creeping around at night because he didn't want anybody to see really this is the pattern that Jesus is looking for there's a bit of preamble and Jesus answered and said to him most assuredly I say to you unless one is born again or born anew or born from above, it's the same Greek word, it's, I think, deliberately used so that it might be a little uncertain, but that's the truth of it. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the womb a second time? And Jesus said, no, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Human, that's humanity. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The overshadowing like it was for Mary. His spirit is God. Do not marvel, I said to you, must be born again. Ah. 
Now, you may have heard me share on this kind of topic before. Apparently, people said to um, the preacher, John Whitfield, George Whitfield, sorry, why do you keep preaching about you must be born again? You must be born again. And he said, because you must be born again. <laughs> Apparently. And you must be born again after the pattern of Jesus. This is the pattern. He was conceived spiritually. And we need to be conceived spiritually. I was conceived some 78 years ago humanly in the normal way. But I was conceived spiritually much more recently than that. And I sometimes think, well, I'm still being um, conceived or refed or something day by day by day by his spirit, the spirit within you. Because the flesh is getting old and crunky, but the inward man, oh, the inward man is being fed by the spirit. It's a spiritual life, brethren, that we're called to lead so that we, we all may be the many brethren for our first begotten. The first begotten of many brethren. Ah, it's wonderful. So I'll maybe never get tired of saying you must be born again. Or born from above, born anew. It's the same principle. You're born of God. That which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit, and you can only be born of that spirit by God, and by an absolute surrender to him and say, yeah, take me. Like Mary said, be it unto me, me, as you said. We're not required to conceive um, a baby in our wombs, a bit difficult for us men anyway, but um, we are to conceive Jesus in us. And when we've conceived him, he is to grow in us and to grow up so that we grow up to be as he is, to be like him, to have his nature, to walk in his way, to be friendly and kind and gentle. Every characteristic of God in us as we grow up we still grow up. Every day we can learn something new and God can say, not sure about that. And he can take that away if you'll let him. And he'll put something sweet and gentle in its place. Maybe. Yeah, we must be born again. Be it unto me, Lord. We might be brethren unto the first begotten, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you, if you haven't, maybe now is the opportunity when we should, you should do that. You should say to Lord, yeah, Lord, I surrender this morning. I will let go of everything. Can we do that? Father, you see hearts you know where people are at. You know my heart. You know the, my stumblings that have brought me to this point this morning. But Father, I see and know what it is that you're after. And I ask that you might move in any heart that is remotely close to saying yes to you. Anyone who can't go on anymore, needs to do it a different way to say yes to you and to receive of you but so that your spirit might be the overshadowing power that leads to Jesus being born in another heart and life. Hallelujah. He said, I'll give you a new heart, I'll give you a new spirit and I will put my spirit within you. You can receive that this morning. Simply surrender all.
let go. And become a first generation Christian. Not something you've heard from your grandma or your next door neighbor. But something that you've heard from God. Because he's spoken into your heart. It says, will you receive me this morning? Receive.